Right, so I've got great pleasure in welcoming the audience uh, to this webinar, which I'm doing with my colleague, Professor Milindo Chakravarti, on the role of um, social science in the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, just by way of a preliminary introduction, I'm the Dean of the School of Government and Public Policy, which started in the year 2012 in the General Global University. And it's one of the nine schools that have been established in the university already. The university is primarily a, a social science, um, non uh, engineering, non-medicine university. Um, and so we are mainly concerned about understanding how human beings relate to the world around them. That's the primary focus, whether it is in the law school or the business school or the School of International Relations or in government and public policy or journalism or uh, sustainable environment, uh, liberal arts. All of these schools in our university are focused on uh, the primary condition of human welfare and improving human well-being uh, and being able to live with one another in a a uh, very complex interrelated world. Um, and, and so our faculty and the schools are all very interdisciplinary. Um, so students who join in the one school can take courses in other schools. And this is very deliberate. If you came to our university, you will not find different buildings with the name of the school on them. Um, that itself conveys that all of these schools and their main purpose in education is integrated and linked. And with that background, my own background and this particular topic is of special interest to me because I, I worked in, uh, I studied in Bangalore University, Delhi University, Oxford, then Cambridge, and then I worked in the Ford Foundation. And for a very long time, for 22 years, I worked in the United Nations development program. And so I've been living through uh, all that the United Nations has been doing with respect to development concerns as a policy advisor. I was very involved in the uh, implementation of the Millennium Development Goals, which ended in 2015. And then just before the Millennium Development Goals ended, the world community, all the member states of the United Nations, agreed upon a set of goals that are called sustainable development goals. Now there's one big difference between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals and why each of us should be interested in the Sustainable Development Goals now. The Millennium Development Goals were drafted mainly by the UN agencies. After the heads of state uh, came together at the Millennium in the year 2000 and agreed that the world needs a strong emphasis on democratic governance on human rights and on development, the UN agencies felt it was necessary to formulate some goals so that each government uh, could pursue these goals and show some progress. The original idea for uh, governments to be asked to pursue goals in the UN actually came from uh, a person who was once the head of um, UNICEF. Um, and he, he had, his name was James Grant. And when he became the head of UNICEF, he said, what is my job? I go and meet uh, heads of government and people, uh, but I'm going to do my job a little differently. UNICEF is meant to protect uh, children and uh, mothers, their primary interest. So he said, I'll go and ask every head of government to make one promise. That is that they will realize and achieve one goal immunize all children against all of the diseases that are known to be uh, harmful to children for which there are vaccinations and you can protect them. So he went around meeting heads of governments and asked them, make me this promise. I'll come back in a few years time and you should have fulfilled this. Now this worked very well. It was extraordinarily successful. Uh, somehow this idea that we stick to this goal, realize the goal, do everything that it takes. And it's not easy 
to get every child immunized because vaccines need to be kept in cold storage. They have to reach very remote corners of the world and people. So, but he did it. So then the UN system thought, therefore, it's a good idea to, to set some goals, um, to get the governments to agree upon them. So the Millennium Development Goals were drafted basically by the UN agencies, and there was not much buy-in from countries. India, for instance, took a long time before they said, okay, we will do something about the Millennium Development Goals, because the position was we signed up to the declaration on uh, the Millennium uh, Goals, uh, the development, but we didn't sign up to each of these targets and goals. So the result was um, somewhat positive, but not altogether positive. However, having learned this lesson, the UN began a very extensive process of consulting civil society, universities, students, activists, governments, and formulated after several meetings and discussions led by a high powered body of very, very capable uh, world leaders. Um, at the time, the body was chaired by the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and by the President of Indonesia. And they had several meetings, and we then ended up having these 17 sustainable development goals. So what this means is that there's been much more buy-in. The second difference between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals is the Millennium Development Goals apply to developing countries. It is as if the richer countries are saying, you guys set targets, achieve them. We'll do our little bit to help you by way of international cooperation and partnership. That's not the case with the Sustainable Development Goals because now there's a realization that all countries, all of us are inheriting one planet and therefore all of the countries need to adhere to and follow these Sustainable Development Goals. And what extent to which they will achieve the goals is left to each country. And in fact, to each region or location because you cannot generalize it and say everybody must pursue the same uh, targets. However, there's been an agreement on these 17 goals and we are very excited as a university and uh, Professor Melindo uh, Chakravarti's uh, taken a lead in trying to make our university unique in all of India by being, uh, by having the capacity to pursue and track the sustainable development goals, to make a contribution as an intellectual institution as an educational institution for the achievement of these goals. Now, most universities um, have not paid much attention to it. They think that these goals are the responsibility of NGOs, civil society organizations, and professional bodies or governments, but educational institutions have not come to the forefront. And we want to be in the forefront of achieving the sustainable development goals as far as India is concerned. And that means we have to ask the question, what is it that the knowledge that we impart, the education that we give, how is that going to help the achievement of the sustainable development goals? Now, this is uh, an important um, question to ask because traditionally we've divided our studies into economics, one box, political science, another, psychology, sociology, anthropology, law, um, international relations, and so on. And by remaining in these silos or cubicles, we often miss the connections that are between each of them and to get a more holistic understanding. Now, the wonderful thing about the Sustainable Development Goals is there are 17 of them and there are a number of interesting linkages. Some goals um, are very, very, essential for the achievement of other goals. In the case of some other goals, it may be that if you pursue them uh, wholeheartedly, you may be slackening up in your commitment to some other goal. If you said everybody should have access to a high level of energy and therefore you used fossil fuels, you will be compromising the goal related to climate change and sustainability. So we need to get a holistic understanding where there is a good blending of what we know from the natural sciences and how are we to make policy? How is policy to be informed for the achievement of these goals? And this means 
that we have designed consciously our programs, the MA in public policy, the BA honors social science and policy, are consciously designed to get students um, and faculty, because it's a innovative experiment that we are undertaking, to understand the interrelations between insights that are drawn from each of these disciplines. It doesn't mean you become an economist or a sociologist or an anthropologist after you do this degree. What you will have is a very rounded grasp of social science per se. All the insights that come from these key disciplines and an ability to apply them in a policy context. And the context in which we need to apply them is to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. So we need to understand, you know, why are there targets? Why are these indicators? Are they meaningful? What are these metrics? How, what is quantifiable? What is not quantifiable? How do you make a judgment on how to prioritize these goals? How do you handle tensions between these goals where the primacy given to the one goal may relegate another goal to some extent? Uh, how do you recognize which goal is essential for the achievement of another goal? All of these require not economics alone, not politics alone, not anthropology alone, not psychology alone, but a very holistic understanding. So that's, that's the background to why we are having this particular discussion on the role of the social sciences in the achievement of the sustainable development goals. So with those words, I'll hand over to my colleague, Professor Milindo Chakrabarti to elaborate. Hi, welcome to the webinar. And Professor Sudarshan has given you a very, very uh, lucid and very comprehensive introduction to the issue of sustainable development and the associated sustainable development goals. <clears throat> if you have a look at the title of the webinar today, you will find that it composes of two very distinct components, which apparently look unrelated to one another. One is the policy studies, and the other one is the sustainable development goal. And we are trying to question ourselves as to how and whether, and to what extent, policy studies are relevant in the context of realization of sustainable development goals per se. So I would like to emphasize on the two components in the title, one being policy studies and the other one being the sustainable development goal. As Professor Sudarshan pointed out very clearly that we started with this goal business, achievement of some goals uh, in 2000 with the Millennium Development Goal. And by 2015, we realized that, well, perhaps the uh, Millennium Development Goal, the way we framed them, was either not enough for the purpose of human development and for us to move forward, or sometimes they were unachievable as well if some other components are not simultaneously taken into account. If you have a look at the Millennium Development Goal, you will find that it was fundamentally based on an economic metric. We had some economic goals to achieve, and we uh, equated development to achievement of certain economic goals which are measurable and which can be taken care of uh, by using of some financial resources to be made available by the donors and the uh, receiving countries will be able to use them to catch up with their developed partners. But by 2015, it was realized that, well, uh, Millennium Development Goal is perhaps neither achievable nor desirable to be achieved as well, because we have to go beyond that. And that led to the formulation of what we call the Sustainable Development Goal. And we want, and the fundamental point of deriving or developing the Sustainable Development Goal is the realization of the fact that we have to go beyond pure economic metrics, and we have to get into some other domains as well. So 17 goals were identified, and now 
uh, literature, fast literature has grown with time, that these goals can be divided into three distinct but interrelated components. The first component we can call are goals related to economy. There are four goals there, SDG 8, which asks for decent work and uh, economic growth, SDG 9, which calls for industry innovation and infrastructural development, SDG 10, which are used in favor of reduced inequalities, and SDG 12, which calls for responsible consumption and production. Even though I have a difference in opinion, I would put the reduced inequalities not in the economic metric, but I will put it into some other metric which we are coming to. Because I don't think that inequality is not only in terms of economics, but there are social and political inequality as well. And SDG is also very keen to take care of those inequalities simultaneously. The second component of the SDG deal with the society. Herein lies the very important difference between MDGs and SDGs. MDGs did not go beyond economics, but SDGs realized that those economic goals cannot be achieved unless and until some social goals are achieved simultaneously. What are those social goals? SDG 1, no poverty. SDG 2, zero hunger. SDG 3, good health and welfare. SDG 4, quality education. SDG 5, very, very important, gender equality. SDG 7, affordable and clear energy. SDG 11, sustainable cities and uh, communities and SDG 16, which was never considered to be a component in the process of development of human society, peace, justice, and strong institutions. We economists often believed for a long time that institutions do not matter for economic development. Milton Friedman very clearly and openly argued that, well, institutions do not matter. It's the economic stupid. We only want to change the economic system, and then with the help of a market-led economic system, we can achieve that. But sustainable development is very, very much into the issue of taking care of the social issues, this, the societal problems. And it is an admission of the fact that if these societal problems are not solved, the economic metrics in terms of development cannot be improved either. And there, are, there is an interconnection between these two. One reinforces improvement in one, reinforces the improvement of in terms of the other sector. But more important, what MDG to a large extent missed out and what was considered to be of immense importance is the importance given to biosphere development it is now realized that cannot be achieved in the absence of showing our concerns for the protection and conservation of the biosphere and the biosphere talks in terms of four sdgs SDG number six is clean water and sanitation. SDG number 13 is climate action. SDG number 14 is life below water. And SDG number 15 is life on land. So when we are talking about SDGs, we are really clear about the challenges that we are going to face if we want to achieve all of them in a simultaneous manner. And quite obviously, the fact is, uh, we, are, we are quite clear that a simple economic approach to development, which we had been following for years, will not give us the pathway as to how we can link these three sets of goals together in a balanced 
and as Sudarshan said, in a holistic manner. And that takes us away from the use of market in solving the problem of sustainable development. And we have realized that there are several instances and several possibilities of market failure which are there not to create an effective operational interlinkage between economy, society, and biosphere. Because if you have a look at the way the market operates, market, fortunately or unfortunately, does not take care of two very important horizons that are of relevance in human life. Number one, market does not consider the time horizon. Market is not concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow. Market is concerned about what is going to happen today and how can I optimize my uh, gains or welfare today itself. I need not be concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow. And that is the one issue that was raised by uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Commission uh, way back in 19, uh, 18s, that we have come to a situation where we have to take care of the next generation. Uh, a Native American leader once said that, well, we did not inherit, inherit the art from our predecessors. We have borrowed it from our next generation. So the fact is that we have realized that it's not just a question of inheritance. The mother art is not an issue of inheritance. It is an issue related, linked to the fact that we have borrowed it from our future generation. So intergenerational equity came out in a very, very clear way in the context of our understanding of sustainable development. But it also came in, came very clearly then, that is where there was a debate between the social scientists and the natural scientists. The natural scientists perhaps put a lot of, un, uh, I would say disproportionately higher level of emphasis on maintenance of intergenerational equity. And they did not care much for maintenance of intergenerational equity as well. If intergenerational equity is not taken care of, I am afraid intergenerational equity cannot be thought of either. So when we are talking about uh, sustainable development goal, the most important point is that we are trying to develop a balance between maintenance of intergenerational equity with intergenerational equity. That's the main challenge we are facing today. And we have realized that, well, market cannot help us in doing so. First of all, market does not have a time horizon. And the second point is, market does not have a social horizon either. Market does not distinguish the social status of two consumers or social status of two producers. So all of them are either consumers or producers irrespective of their social position, capabilities, and social status, political status, or whatever you talk of. And sustainable development is unique in, from that perspective, that it takes care of, and it has agreed that there is no other option but to take care of the time horizon and the social horizon together. And what else can take care of both of them? That is where comes the role of policy studies or role of public policy. When I talk about public policy, I am very categorical that I don't mean that it refers to only the policies by the state. A public policy can happen at several place, uh, layers and several levels. Whenever, uh, instead of an individual, a group of individual takes the decision to solve a problem that becomes a public policy. So a civil society organization participates in a public policy. A community participates in making a public policy. A state also participates in making a public policy. But 
it is not the uh, domain for the state alone or the government alone to think or to be capable or to take care of the public policy process. All of us have to participate in the process of public policy at several layers and at several levels to contribute to the process of solving some of these SDG related issues. When we talk yeah. about Melinda, yeah, would you like I, to come in? On, on, just on this point, um, yes. I, I want our audiences to know uh, that your definition of uh, public policy comes with a great depth of knowledge. I want all the listening here to know that you worked with the one person who got a Nobel Prize in economics whose main discipline was classified as political science, Elena Ostrom. And that in her work, um, she looks at what happens when government makes decisions uh, about the allocation of resources or the utilization of natural resources. What happens when the market or the private sector is in complete charge of how natural resources are used? And what happens when the community um, controls and uses the natural resources? So these are different modalities. It can be overly the state, it can be overly the market, but her great insight was to show that in many contexts, particularly with respect to uh, what um, uh, Melindo emphasized, the biosphere's part, that leaving it to communities to manage their affairs without undue regulation and interference by the state and without market principles coming and taking over. So if you privatize all the commons uh, and make it into individual property, uh, it will be a loss for human welfare. Um, if you made it all state-owned, as was done in um, the Soviet Union um, and um, in regimes that believed uh, that the state should control everything, you get very unsatisfactory results. So it is this understanding that public policy is too important to be left only to those sitting in government and saying they are policy makers. It's too important to be left to those who are managing very large corporations and affecting our lives in every way. It is very important to recognize the role of the community in the conservation of common property resources in generally improving human welfare. So I wanted to uh, all of you to know that you're listening to a person who has spent a, a large amount of his scholarly life uh, and investigations in the field uh, and speaks from knowledge and experience. Over to you, Melindo. Thank you, Sudarshan. Uh, the point that uh, that is very, very important, that when we are talking about SDGs, there is no dilemma, there is no doubt that we have only one tool to achieve the SDGs, and that tool is public policy. We cannot do, and a public policy that opens up the space to everyone to participate in that process. I am not talking about a public policy where it is run by a state at a dictatorial level. I am talking about a participatory public policy where all of us can contribute and share our concerns and come out with a sort of a solution which are more or less acceptable to most of us although even though i don't believe in majority rule anyway uh, the point that one has to understand now that how is a public policy made in an ideal sense a public policy making has got four components apparently distinct but highly interlinked the first component of public policy making is linked to identification of the theory of change, meaning what really we want to do, what really we should do to uh, achieve the changes that we have in our mind. It is mostly an academic exercise backed by 
research and field level experiences so that we can identify the relevant factors which can play an important role in bringing about the desired change. And we also would like to know as to what are the desired changes that we want to achieve. And SDGs have already given us those desired changes that we want to achieve. So the first point is we have to identify as to what are the factors which are to be taken into account. And these are the factors which have been identified as the targets under each of the SDGs. So we have identified some targets that we would like to achieve them. And if we achieve these targets, we would be on our way to achieve the goals. Now, in India, often we say, this is a very common refrain. Sudarshan will agree with me. We often make, a mis make an argument that, well, the policy was very good, but it was not properly implemented. Yes. And I often raise a question that if a policy is not implementable, how can we call that policy to be good? Yes. So we cannot just make a list of fire switches that we want to achieve this and we want to achieve that, but that has to be backed by some operational principle and some operational model as well. Unfortunately, in India, often we find that our policies are often either either not backed by any theory of change. It just comes out of mind that we will be doing this or we will be doing that. And secondly, having, having said that we want to achieve this, we stop there. We don't know how to achieve those policy objectives and the policy goals. And we generally do not develop any operational <coughs> model as to how to achieve this. These two components in the operational model is the design of the policy as to what are the interventions, what are the inputs that you want to be introduced to achieve the desired change. That is the design, just as an engineer designs a house or a structure or a bridge, we also have to have some exercise in terms of designing the change, designing the process. And then comes the role of another group who are called the implementers, who have designed. But how to implement them? Those who are designing are often not going to the field to implement at the field level. It is left out to another set of individuals to implement. And then comes the final group, whose role is to find out whether the theory of change was correct or whether the theory of change was uh, really taking care of the whole process, whether the design was according to the theory of change, or whether the design tallied with the ground level reality. Did it help the implementing agencies to really implement them, or whether it was implemented properly? So these three questions are addressed to by another group of people called the evaluators. So when we are talking about public policy, when we are talking about policy studies, we are talking about a collective of people from these four domains. One who will be engaged in making the theory of change, one who will be making the design of the program, one who would be implementing the intervention, and finally one who will be evaluating and then would be giving the feedback to the other three groups. And these four groups ideally need not work in silos. They have to work together. And since we have not been able to develop an ecosystem where these four types of individuals work together and have some, each one of them, in, irrespective of the specialization of their domain, has some understanding of the how the other domains operate and what are the interlinkages across these domains, policy studies of policy, public policy making process often becomes very, very one-sided, either dominated by the theoreticians or dominated by the implementing agency or being dominated by the designers. So Sudarshan wants to come here. Yeah, no, I just want to um, reinforce your point about um, these actors, those who design the policy, 
and those who implement it and those who are responsible for assessing on the ground whether the policy goals were achieved with the theory of change was uh, correct in the first place. Um, that's one set of silos. But more practically, we end up with governments and ministries and departments. And unfortunately, they think that they uh, should protect their own turf. Now, the interesting thing about the Sustainable Development Goals is really their interconnections. And if we, one of the things we need to do, one of the goals is Goal 16 has a reference to governance. The Millennium Development Goals did not talk at all about governance, they were very technocratic in their uh, formulation. But this one talks about access to justice. It talks about uh, governance and, and peace. And therefore, we need to worry about how are we structuring decision-making processes at different levels, at the government, at the central level, at provincial or the state level, and at the districts. Because you see, we, it's common sense. Uh, you know, if you, if you uh, were in school and you were talking to children, they'll understand that if you ended hunger, which is goal number two, Ooh. it makes a direct contribution to the goal of eradicating poverty, which is goal one. It makes a positive contribution to promoting health, which is goal three. And it makes a positive contribution to achieving quality education for all, which is goal four. Now, if you address chronic malnourishment, now this is not this goal is indivisible from the goal of reducing uh, eliminating oh, yeah. poverty so tackling malnourishment will reinforce educational efforts of children um, so you see the what happens unfortunately is if you assign each goal to a government department and that department is only focusing on its particular goal and is unable to see these other reactions we could be in trouble so one of the contributions that we need to make as a new generation of learners and committed to achieving the sustainable development goals is to have a very, very subtle understanding and to help influence the way decisions are made in government. Because you see, you may say, uh, okay, let's produce, uh, food production is important. But if you want to just increase food production, you have a problem with the renewable energy production goal, which is goal seven, um, the terrestrial ecosystem protection, that can be affected because you're competing for water and land. Um, so we need to understand the constraints, the tensions, the uh, synergies amongst these different goals. And therefore we need a new vision of policy making that does not assign a policy to a department or a ministry and says you take care of education and somebody else is worrying about water and sanitation uh, so because these if you, if you fail on education you will fail on um, social inclusion so no point in having a ministry for minorities protection if you do not pay attention to uh, education and a proper kind of education that promotes values of tolerance understanding appreciation that celebrates diversity in society so it's not simply education it is what kind of education what is the content of education so therefore what i'm trying to say is that we are now embarked on a very exciting adventure we are now contending with a, a, a pandemic which shows all the inter interconnections this pandemic is not a health ministry business this pandemic has affected educational institutions. It's affected transport. It's affected international Agri trade. It's affected, it's affected agriculture. It's affected every walk of life. So here is a, 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 we are living through this. No one can, after living through this pandemic, can say these things are not interrelated and therefore we can deal with them separately in silos. So, an integrated understanding of policy with key knowledge and inputs from different disciplines. You see, you, we are living in uncertain times. Uncertainty, a grasp on uncertainty requires a good understanding of probability. It 
good understanding of what's known as Bayesian statistics. You know, these are the bread and butter of what we can teach in our courses, but they are taught with a certain instrumental purpose. They are taught in such a way that you can connect it. You can connect how do you deal with uncertainty? How do you deal with the elements in human life that are predictable and elements in human life that are essentially unpredictable, which gives rise to a lot of uncertainties. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the financial markets? Um, how do you deal with what is known as a, we, we have now been talking about herd immunity, um, that if a substantial number of people get an immunity to a particular infection, like a virus infection, the chances of everyone being safe are much higher because you're not going to be spreading it. The natural uh, systems in the body contain it. But there's also a herd immunity in terms of behavior, in terms of how people behave with respect to the stock market, uh, with respect to prices, uh, hoarding, uh, rushing off to buy goods because you think it will get cleared out, will definitely clear them out. Your very act of protecting yourself from goods being cleared out and you're not getting your share of it, your behavior make sure that it gets cleared out, right? So we need to understand the psychology behind these things. We need to get a grasp of all of these elements. So policy studies is not just about the one discipline. It's not just about one ministry. It's not just about operating in silos. Over to you. So uh, thanks for giving such a very lucid uh, description of what I wanted to argue. Uh, I, I would just like to uh, uh, wrap up the whole argument first with a very interesting example that I found in Assam. In Assam, they have developed a Ministry of Sustainable Development, hmm. whose job is to coordinate across all the ministries who are to deal with, the, apparently to deal with the uh, different goals under SDGs. And there is a coordinating mechanism. That's what they have developed in Assam. And I found that very interesting. And most of the Northeastern states have also uh, subscribed to the idea. And they are also developing Ministry of Sustainable Development. And they have they are developing sustainable development goal cells where they are coordinating the whole process. To conclude and wrap up my whole uh, argument is that perhaps we have seen that be it sustainable development goal on the other one hand and be it policy making on the other hand both of them operate at different layers and these different layers are interconnected among themselves and when we are talking about policy studies in sustainable development goal you might have realized that there will be millions of interconnectedness across these two domains. You can you can have SDGs at uh, gram panchayat level. You can have policies to achieve SDG at a district level. You can have policies to achieve SDGs at a state level. Right now, we at RIS we are working on a study as to whether and how we can have policy mechanism to achieve SDGs at cross-border level. If you have a look at the borders, you will find that on both sides of the border, you have uh, uh, two different communities, two communities, many of whom share common cultural, historical heritage. So can there be some mechanisms to develop cross-border sustainable development goals mechanisms? are there requirements are they necessary if yes how can they be done because they share this almost similar uh, sort of ecosystem they simil uh, share almost similar nature of agricultural system because they are mostly on the same agroclimatic zones so the point is when we are talking about sustainable development goal we have to keep in mind the ultimate objective of sustainable development which says keeping no one behind so when you are talking about keeping no one behind 
perhaps sometimes we have to think in terms of achieving SDGs, even ignoring or even overlooking the political borders that we have artificially created among ourselves. So we are talking about sustainable development from a global perspective, not purely I, from a very local perspective. Sudarshan, please. Yeah, no, I just to, you know, just to make it a little more practical for our audience, um, you, it's uh, very good that you refer to the Assam uh, arrangement where there's a body charged with sustainable development goals, which is meant to coordinate and try and overcome the silo mentality of ministries and departments. What I want to say for the benefit of those listening is that in our program, we try to get our students to do internships and capstone projects and work with uh, departments that are like this department in Assam that uh, Melindo mentioned, or the Niti Aayog at the national level, the Niti Aayog is responsible for monitoring and uh, reporting on India's progress with the Sustainable Development Goals. So all of this uh, emphasis on the Sustainable Development Goals opens up a phenomenal opportunity for students to learn by doing, by working alongside people concerned with these goals. What it means is that if you are a natural scientist, say a chemist um, or a, a astrophysicist, you would be in a um, looking through a telescope, uh, you would be in a laboratory uh, experimenting with uh, chemicals. Um, if you are a virologist, you would be studying the RNA and the different strains of uh, viruses and why they attach themselves to some particular cell and not to other cells and so on. So there's always hands-on practical work. For in our university, the hands-on practical work that we expect our students to do will be with institutions like the Assam Ministry for Sustainable Development, like the Niti Aayog, where we expect our students to spend periods of time working alongside people who are grappling with the real problems, right? But that's a very important way of, so we have, in a sense, the social science counterpart to the natural science lab uh, by sending students out um, into the community to talk to, to learn how to talk to village people, to understand what knowledge it is they have, uh, to first educate them as well as learn from them. So this opportunity to be able to learn uh, from ordinary people as well as scholars is rather unique. Uh, in most situations, you know, syllabuses are finished, examinations are asked, uh, questions are set about what is in the syllabus and students um, somehow uh, manage to answer these exam questions. They take their degrees and leave. We are not in that business. Our aim is to make knowledge actually applicable, practical, and useful. And one way of testing what knowledge that you've learned in the university, in the classroom, is actually useful is by sending you out to someone who is actually tackling this problem, who is tackling the problem of, um, you know, what do, what do I do if uh, there is not enough energy? Uh, how can I uh, achieve an education goal uh, if there's no electricity? Uh, so how do I now coordinate and work with uh, people who will make sure that electricity is available? So these are the kinds of practical issues. So we are very conscious that we must set you in situations, students in situations where they learn a lot by actually doing. Um, and that's why I'm glad that um, Melinda also mentioned RIS. RIS is a uh, is a venerable old institution in this country. It's called Research and Information Systems. It's uh, it's some it's a part of uh, our governmental apparatus, which is very focused on South-South cooperation, because countries facing similar challenges, similar uh, goals, um, have to achieve them, and learning from one another and to understand how to do that. So the emphasis on uh, across borders. Uh, what is the big difference between people living 
uh, in uh, uh, Bangladesh and in the bordering uh, states in India. They are people, uh, their culture, their practices, their anthropology uh, is very similar. So why can't we then figure out instead of uh, hard lines of division, how, and, and rivers flow through different countries. Um, one of the public policy examples that I like to give where you think you're doing good, right? And nobody would object that it's a good thing to do was the eradication of malaria in the Terai region between India and Nepal. That was done with USAID help. They sprayed DDT over the forests of <laughs> the, which were uh, the breeding ground for mosquitoes and severe malaria. So malaria got eradicated. But what happened, an unintended consequence was, now that there's no malaria, people can come and live there. And when people come and live there, they cut down the trees. And if they cut down the trees and they say, okay, we'll have agriculture, you cut down the trees of the Tarai, you've opened the, all of Bihar to annual flooding. So floods was a new problem that came as a result of trying to tackle another problem, which was malaria, right? So this comes out of just narrowly focusing on something and not trying to anticipate what would be the follow on consequences of what you're doing. So to this day, we are paying a price uh, for the good that was done, which was to eradicate malaria in the Tarai, but then opening ourselves to damage by floods year after year. So this is where you need to be able to be in the field, to be able to, now if somebody had talked to ordinary people uh, in the Tarai who have experience with agriculture and the fact that what we regard as pests may in fact be beneficial um, you know, to uh, other forms because of ecological connections, that kind of knowledge is with the, with the farmer. It's not there with um, the Indian Administrative Service highly trained uh, officer sitting in the agriculture ministry. The farmer knows things that may not be known. And one of the things we try to get our students to learn is how to learn from farmers, how to be able to talk to them. So I wanted to underline this because there are exciting opportunities um, in the course of these studies to actually be located in places like RIS, which has this very uh, visionary ambition of working across India's borders um, and learning lessons from the global south. Any questions? Well, do we have uh, questions? Yes, uh, I was just uh, inviting questions. If we, if you have any questions, you can put them on the chat box. You can send across the questions to us. Okay, there's a couple of questions I can see. Um, mm -hmm. How can we influence decisions, the way decisions are made by the government? Is there a way we can help them actually identify the real stakeholders and take them into consideration? Then, so policymakers have to be a, a doctor of medicine to see which policy clashes with which one and to which degree. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a very good observation because uh, you know if you don't uh, have a more uh, rounded holistic picture um, and you just plow your own farrow, uh, you'll, um, you'll miss the wood for the trees, as they say. Or the other analogy I like to use is that we shouldn't behave like the fable, the six blind men and the elephant. Uh, this is an Indian fable where uh, the fable talks about how somebody held the trunk of the elephant and described the elephant as looking like something like a tree and somebody catches hold of the tail and says, oh, the elephant is really very much like a snake. And somebody catches hold of the ears of the elephant and says, oh, it's like a big fan. Um, so, but none of them is getting the full picture uh, of what the elephant is, uh, because you're focusing on what you experience and you feel, but you need to know what it is to be in the shoes of somebody else uh, and to be able to look at things from a different vantage point and a different perspective which is what a great deal of education is all about. Uh, it's the kind of person that you become, not the facts and figures that you can carry in your head. Milindo? Well, may I, may I come in? 
please. Oh. So how can cooperative farming be integrated with SDGs? Now you can say something about that, Milindo. Hello? Milindo, can you hear me? Hello, Pankaj, is someone there in the organizers? I yes, sir, I'm here, Professor. We lost the uh, connection with uh, Professor Melindo. So, yeah, yes. if we can address to the question that has been asked, uh, how can the cooperative farming be integrated with the... Yes, I wanted Professor Melindo to, uh, to answer it. Is he able to? I think uh, sir, he will is trying to reconnect. So we are still okay. not sending him online. Okay, so let let me let me attempt an answer to to that question um, about cooperative uh, farming. Um, I made a reference to to it uh, a little earlier when I said that uh, we need to understand that some of the ways of protecting natural resources and land and water are natural resources. One of the good ways of conserving them is not by the government deciding you should do this and that, or by corporations and companies um, taking over uh, land and saying we will have uh, private sector corporations engaged in agriculture and producing and marketing of agricultural goods. We need we cannot have individual farmers um, trying to compete for scarce resources uh, without some form of cooperation. Um, agriculture needs water. Farming needs water. So you need to have some understanding between those farms that are upstream. So it could be that they try to siphon off uh, all the water and not let enough water go downstream in which case the farms downstream will not have enough water. So it makes a lot of sense to, to think of modes of cooperation uh, between the upstream farmers and the downstream farmers so that there's a more equitable distribution. We already have it in our traditional agricultural practices. We have this kind of cooperation. You know, if you came to study in the General Global University, at different points in time, you will see lots of cattle, 500, 600 cattle walking down the road with one or two Gujar men managing a very large herd. But they come to graze on other people's farms. So this is an old classical understanding that you, okay, you have the right to take your animals, uh, to get them to rest on somebody's land, to graze there, to fertilize the land, because when cattle are parked and grazing in a particular land, they drop cow dung, and cow dung is a very good fertilizer. So the farmer who allows uh, the cattle to come and stay on his land benefits, the cattle uh, herdsman benefits. So therefore, this is the kind of cooperation, right? So cooperative farming in the sense of under the National Cooperative Act, uh, some form of, uh, partnership or companies like a cooperative credit society. That's one legal way of doing it. But in real practice, we need to figure out various ways of cooperative farming because farming will not be sustainable unless there is cooperation because it requires the husbandry. That's a very old English word, the husbandry of resources that are scarce, land and water. I hope that answers the question. Any, any other questions? Um, Pankaj, I think we are nearing the end of our time.
Yeah, right, sir. We uh, are almost done with the time, but uh, there are two more questions if you would like to take them up. What are they? So uh, one question is, so the policy, so how exactly we can influence the way decisions are made by the government? Is there a way that can help them actually identify the real stakeholders and take them into consideration? Well, this is this is a um, an important question. It has to do with under the sustainable development goals. It has to do with goal uh, 16, uh, because what we need is a more informed and active citizenry. Uh, if you have a very passive attitude as a people, thinking the sarkar is my bab. Uh, we don't have to worry, everything would be given, employment would be given by Sarkar, uh, food would be given by Sarkar, uh, you know, uh, health facilities, uh, Bhima Yojana, all this would be provided by the government. It creates a culture of dependence, uh, which is not healthy. But you need to demand accountability from the government. So how do you demand accountability from the government? Uh, by being informed, firstly, about what uh, what is the significance or meaning of actions taken by the government? So one of the ways of influencing the decisions of the government is by being in a position to first understand what the decisions of the government are and then to be able to critique them, right? So, and to have a very lively, important debate in society because there is, for instance, in the pandemic, there's a feeling, oh, we wish, if you can permit, migrant workers now when the pandemic is still going on and there's still a risk of infection and uh, the death rates may go up the infections may go up but you've decided at this point in time you will move migrant workers to their homes make arrangements for transport now uh, an informed citizenry will have to ask the question of the government why wasn't this done at the beginning because if they can go now um, when we are not yet in the safe, clear zone. Why couldn't they have gone then? What constraints prevented you from doing it? Now, being able to ask such questions of the government and demanding answers and accountability is what democracy is all about. Democracy is the responsibility of the rulers to the ruled. It is not about five years, periodic elections, and once I'm elected, I can do what I like, uh, and then I wait for five years, and then I go again to the people and say, listen, you know, I couldn't do some of the things I promised, but you know, I'm such a nice person, please re-elect me again. That's not the way democracy is supposed to work. The way democracy is supposed to work is that the government of the day is under scrutiny every day. It's not just on election day. That means we need a more informed public. We need more students from universities to take a greater interest in public affairs, in the well-being of the community, not simply think in terms of oh, what, how, what kind of a job will I get, what is the salary that I'll get, uh, and how I can live comfortably and well for myself. No, a, a public policy requires an understanding of the primacy of the public, the public interest, and therefore I'd urge students to play a part, to ask questions under the Right to Information Act, learn how to do that, demand answers from the government. Those are the ways in which we can keep government on the toes. And if we keep government on the toes, it will do a better job than if we just let them be. Okay, that's my answer to that question. Uh, and um, then there was a question about cooperative farming we dealt with. In the context of the pandemic, do you think the government will change the way policies on health are designed and implemented? I think so. I think all over the world, uh, governments will have to seriously think about um, health as a public good. Health is a public good, um, and, but governments treat it more like a merit good. I mean, in other words, uh, it, you see, uh, in, in strictly speaking, a public good is something like a lighthouse. Once you have a lighthouse, you can't prevent a ship from seeing the light coming to the shore. Uh, you can't say, you must pay me uh, for seeing my light, right? The, you cannot exclude anybody from 
the lighthouse, the benefit of the lighthouse. But with respect to health and education, it is as if it is a public good because it has consequences for everything else in our life. But we, so we call it a merit good, just to make a strict distinction between a public good where you cannot exclude somebody from using it. In the case of education, you can exclude somebody who cannot pay fees from entering into an institution. In the case of medicine, health, you can exclude some patient who is unable to pay the fees to come into the hospital. But we should treat, now the lesson of this epidemic is, we should treat health as a public good. And therefore there must be much more public provision of health facilities and much more international cooperation in the provisioning of health and exchange of information about viruses, vaccines, medicines, joint research, and so on. It's much more aware that pharmaceutical companies should not be allowed to make excessive profits uh, by claiming intellectual property rights uh, over drugs that will benefit millions and millions of people. So a whole range of policy choices have to be made and this is a very, very hard lesson to all governments that they must change the way policies on health are designed and implemented. I think that's about it. Questions? Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for taking those uh, questions. Oh, oh there, is, there is a question about evaluation as a component of public policy and what's the uh, what's our idea of current evaluation infrastructure with respect to social audit. Now, this is a very interesting question. First thing I would say is that in India, there is a very serious shortage of people with skills to properly evaluate projects and programs. So one of the things we emphasize in our university is imparting project and program evaluation and monitoring skills. This has a very, very, it's a very un, unmet need. Uh, the country needs many more people with those skills and knowledge than it has. So there's guarantee, there's every program and policy of CSRs as well as the government has a component as a line item that says evaluation, but they don't spend the money on that because they can't find people who are capable of doing it professionally and properly. So one promise I can make is that if you join the General School of Government and Public Policy, you will know what are sound and sensible techniques of evaluation, which is a, which is a, a, a skill. It's not something that you do intuitively. Um, you have to learn it. Um, you have to get a mastery over it. Uh, and it involves an understanding of um, statistics. It involves making judgments. It involves understanding when you use qualitative research methods, when you use quantitative research methods, all of that comes into this. So I would say that the situation with respect to social audit impact assessment in India is uh, not very good. And that's because we don't yet have people, enough people capable of doing it. Just as we realize we do, you know, there may not be enough doctors, enough ventilators, enough something else. It's always been known that we are in serious shortage of evaluation skills uh, and knowledge in this country, and we need to expand that supply. Anybody else? Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, sir, Professor Sudarshan, for taking up the questions. It was a very informative session for all of us, and it is Always a pleasure to listen to you on these webinars. I'm sure the crowd has been mesmerized with the kind of knowledge that you have passed on to them. Thank you so much for taking it up for us. And thank you. Thank you to all the attendees who have been a part of this webinar and shown in trust in participating in this wonderful conversation that we had with Professor Sudarshan. Thank you all. I would be ending the webinar. And thank you to Melindo who is um, really very, very wise. Of course, yes. I, how can we miss him? <laughs> Thank you. So, so much. Thank you.